Realism in watercolor doesn't have to be hard and does not require a bunch of fancy supplies and in today's video, I'm going to show you how to paint a realistic blue rose like this one here in 4 easy steps and as a bonus, I'll show you how to make different type of watercolor splatters to decorate your paintings, so stay tuned! Hi, this is Francoise, welcome or welcome back to my channel! Today I'm going to walk you through all the steps for this watercolor rose painting and I'll make sure to stop the speed painting when needed so you can see the steps and how exactly I painted this realistic rose. Step 1. Gather your watercolor supplies. It's going to be very basic as I used only blue in my painting as you can see. So you can pick whichever color you like and use that with more or less water to produce different values or if you have more choice in your palette, you can use 3 colors that you think would look good together. I wanted to make this painting a monochrome one and also experiment with several of the blues I had, so I used two different blues, manganese blue hue and phthalo turquoise and also a bluish grey tone, Payne's grey from Windsor & Newton. If you're using just one color, I suggest to prepare three washes of it anyways. It's very important to give yourself a variety of values for realism. Prepare a very light wash, for that you'll mix a lot of water to your paint a darker one where you add more paint and an even darker one that you get with even more paint and less water or simply by adding a little bit of a dark paint to your chosen color like any kind of black, brown or grey. Since I had three distinct colors, a light blue, a darker and brighter blue and a really dark color through Payne's grey, I just prepared one wash of each one of them in order to have everything ready before getting started. If you want to see how your colors come out together, you can swatch them first and let them touch and mix together. And I did this here and I really liked the contrast of Payne's Grey against the other two colors, so I decided to keep that. I also like that my phthalo turquoise is so vivid, I was hoping it would balance the other two colors and I was happy with the outcome because I think it makes my piece more interesting and not too dull. For paint brushes, I suggest to work with at least two, one to paint and one to soften some edges when you need to. It's best if the paintbrush you use to paint can get to a fine tip like the ones I'm showing right here because it's going to help you get into small areas and trace fine details, which we will need for the rosebud in particular. For paper, I used the cold pressed 100% cotton paper by Arches I always use and cut it into a square and usually I also use some masking tape to keep my sheet firmly in place onto my cutting board but I didn't really see how useful this would be for this painting so I didn't do it and afterwards I noticed that my paper had buckled a bit towards the end of the process so I think it would have been more comfortable to use masking tapes anyways but if you don't have any, it's not going to make a big difference, it's just more of a convenient thing. We're not going to use a lot of water here, so I guess hot pressed papers or cellulose made papers, which don't take water as well as what I'm using, would work just fine here. Whatever you have, that's what watercolor can do. But for me, I really like this quality I'm using, because I think it makes everything nicer from colors to mixes, so I prefer to stick with it. And if you're not seeing the results you're after, Try and change the paper and see what happens. And I'll link a video where I talk about that in detail if you'd like to check it out next. These supplies are really the basics you will need to paint a realistic flower and a lot of other different projects too. And if you want to see what I'm using on a regular basis, there is a list of my supplies in the description below. Step 2 is to sketch your flower. If you want to paint this rose, I'll link the reference I found on Unsplash also for you to check out. You can also go ahead and download the sketch through a dedicated link in the description. And from there, you'll be able to print the sketch, you'll be able to transfer it on transfer paper, and then transfer it onto your page, if what you want to do is focus on the watercolor part only. My process to sketch this rose was to draw a rough outline to make sure it's centered, and doing that really helps. Then I drew each petal inside and refined the shape of my outline as I went. I did not try to get each petal exactly the same as in the reference. It was not really my goal here and I think that's one of the differences between realistic work and hyper-realistic work. And even though there are some minor differences between the reference picture and the painting, the watercolor outcome still looks good and really realistic. So for that kind of subject, I think the sketch needs to be accurate. But don't beat yourself up if it's not perfect. It would be different if we did a portrait and wanted to get a likeness. Here we don't, we don't need to get this precise. 
I did not press too hard with the pencil while drawing, and I allowed myself to erase if I needed to. The rosebud was really intricate and those petals really tiny there, so I decided to darken the dark parts of my reference with the pencil to create several landmarks to rely on because when you're going back and forth between painting and reference, it's so easy to get confused with this many shapes. I think it was a good idea to darken those parts because it really helped and besides, I knew the pencil wouldn't be visible there because that's where the darkest value of paint is applied. Step 3, as you may have guessed, is to start painting. Most of the times, I prefer to start with light colors and use the darker values last. The advantage of that is that you don't risk going too dark too fast and you can easily darken your drawing with layers. But sometimes I do the opposite, it just depends on what I feel like doing, I guess. And I start with the shadows, but if you're new at watercolor and you don't feel too used to painting yet, I think it's best to start with your lightest wash and build up on top of that to your own pace with the second wash then the third and darker wash. Water control might make it hard for you to manage layers if you're new at this, so check out the video I linked earlier and also the one I'm linking now for help. The edges of the petals on the left are really blurry on the reference, so I chose to soften their borders with my clean brush. And to achieve this, you need to wipe the edge while still wet with a clean and damp brush. You need to do it fast because it dries really quickly. And if the clean brush is too wet, you may create some blooms there, so make sure it's just damp. And again, the video I just linked will help you out with that kind of issue. What's going to make a rose realistic is contrast. This is why it's good to isolate the dark parts from the start and also spot the lightest areas, but also go back and forth between picture and painting constantly to check what you're doing and use washes of color that are different values. For instance, my paint's gray looks really deep and dark compared to the two other blues I used. To make these dark areas as dark as possible with paint's gray, I made sure the paint was not diluted very much, that it was almost pure. On the opposite, to lighten up these areas that are very light on the reference, I could have left a paper white spot, but I personally find it a little too strong. But this is just my take and frankly I haven't even tried it. So what I did instead was to apply the lightest wash of color I could there, and it's easy to do that if you use a lot of water in your wash. There were tiny bright areas in the rosebud I was not able to get with watercolors, but I knew I would be using white gouache towards the end, so I did not focus on that in this third stage. Step 4 is to use some white gouache or a white colored pencil or a white gel pen to brighten up the lightest areas and add small improvements. I tried using the white pencil first, but I found the results disappointing since it didn't show much on blue, I thought. I could have used my gel pen too, but since there were a few large areas to work on, I was afraid it would look too obvious because I think gel pen, according to my own experience with it, is better for tiny details. So I found that the best medium to fix all the areas, small or big, was going to be white gouache. So I used gouache for the biggest highlights. I added more or less water depending on the intensity of light I was looking for. And since gouache can also be used almost pure to add really bright highlights, I used this for the highlights in the rosebud I had missed previously. My fine tip brush allowed me to recreate these small highlights and perfect realism in this watercolor rose. I promised you a bonus about splatters and here it is. To make the painting more interesting, I added splatters of different sizes and values. I made tiny splatters of paint gray, which is pretty dark, all around the flower. I used a flat synthetic brush that's very firm and I didn't add a lot of water to the brush so my splatters remained pretty small. The advantage of using a firm brush like this one is that you control a bit more where the splatters go. Next I added blue splatters with another brush that is a natural hair fiber brush. It's much less firm and a bit harder to control where the paint lands. And with that one I experimented with more or less water in it to produce small splatters and bigger ones. For the really big splatters I made last, the ones that look quite different from the other ones, I used a pipette. My pipette is actually something you use for infants and toddlers mainly to clean their eyes and nose, but anything else that can pump the water and watercolor paint up and release it with some pressure should work just fine. I have another tip for you. If your paper has buckled, wait for the painting to dry completely and wet the back of it a little bit. Then lay the painting face down on a clean and smooth non-porous surface like a cutting board for instance. Place another non-porous clean and flat piece of material on top of it, like plastic or anything waterproof, on the back of the painting, the part you just wet. And finally, stack a bunch of heavy books on top of all of that for a few hours. 
When you get the painting out, it should be flat and ready for a nice picture. I do that a lot because I'm trying to take good photos for my Instagram page. It's linked below if you want to check it out. And it's much better when the sheet is completely flat. So I'm really happy with the outcome and I've been doing that a lot lately. I hope you enjoyed all the tips. Let me know by liking, commenting, and sharing this video. It means a lot to me as it really helps me grow this channel. And if you enjoy this type of tutorial, don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell for more. Thanks for watching and see you next time.